Lord, we come before you and we, we wonder. Such a time as this, bad decrees, reminds us of Esther. We pray you might overthrow them. We pray we might go back to those freedoms that people fought and died for, having lived under oppression. We wouldn't be quick to surrender them. So we pray that calmer, wiser heads would prevail. Lord, we pray your word would open to us now and that our hearts would be filled with a sense of your presence that we might understand these things that Paul communicates to us about the wonder of the new covenant, that we've been redeemed by faith. So please open your word, I pray now, by the power of the Holy Spirit to now the second service. And minister to us, we pray, by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I have uh, one more thing. We, <laughs> we had a wedding yesterday. And... Uh, I, you know, I went out to get a, a burrito with the boys, the older boys, and just had a great time with them. You know, just talking to your boys and everything. And after that, I was going to go to the dollar store because Caleb was out of a certain kind of battery. And I'm in the dollar store next in, and my phone kind of dee 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 I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get the wedding. I'm like, oh, that's odd. I set that kind of early. And look at it one more time. I'm like, wait a minute, 1600. That's 4 o'clock. I ran out and hopped in my car and exited at 334 wearing jeans and a T-shirt. <laughs> we live past the Eagle Tavern. <laughs> So I call, I call Steven and I'm like, dude, we talked about starting at 4 or 4.05. Uh, I'm, I'm working on it, but I'm in trouble, right? And I start going up Route 100. I'm like, I need a miracle, God. I'm not going to make I need a miracle, man. So I start just flying up the road. And, and behind me, I see an ambulance. And the lights are on and all that. And everybody's, you know, cars always, ambulance shows up. Every driver's like, wow, wow, get to the right. I mean, it's not that hard, but they're all over. So I start, we, and he starts lighting up all the lights ahead of me. So I just stay four or five car lengths ahead. Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> so I get through a bunch of lights. He peels off around 113 or wherever he went, you know, and, and I just, I arrived in the church parking lot in a suit at 401, <laughs> got into the building at 402, saw the groom, <laughs> prayed, and we were out about 405, 406. So... <laughs> God gave me a miracle. <laughs> we'll talk about the laws we go through this morning <clears throat> and our need for grace. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Now, remember, we're now in the great digression. He was talking about this letter. Somebody needs to repent. Uh, we sent Titus. We haven't seen him. We're worried. I left Macedonia. We went to chapter 7, picked up on the theme. They got right with God. They exonerated themselves. But he digresses to say, look, here's the work of the ministry. God ordained us to do this. We present the new covenant in Christ. We, we encourage you knowing these things to be reconciled to God. There's going to be a resurrection. We're going to stand before his judgment seat. Therefore, you need to know him. We beg you, you would receive Christ. So he's going to go through their ministry because once again, in calling the church to accountability, there are those who've attacked Paul and his credibility. And, and so that's what he's getting at. He said, look, do we need as others epistles of commendation to you, like someone has to write on our behalf and say, Paul's okay, listen to him. Or do we need letters of commendation from you? And if you're not sure about this, let's look at Acts 18 for a minute. It will help you to see what he's talking about. Acts chapter 18, left turn. Here is Apollos, a man from Alexandria, eloquent, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus, but he only knows the baptism of John. He doesn't know the rest. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, verse 26, and Aquila and Priscilla, when they heard them, they took him unto them. So they waited till he was done, pulled him aside quietly, and they expounded to him the way of God more perfectly. They explained to him the part that he was missing, that the Messiah has come. His name is Jesus. And so when Apollos was disposed to pass into Achaia, southern Greece, of which Corinth is near the top of it, the brethren wrote to them, exhorting the disciples to receive him. So here's where we get the idea of a letter of commendation. This guy's okay. He knows the Lord. We see the Lord working in his ministry. Let him in. And so he went there and he mightily convinced the Jews there at Ephesus, in Achaia. 
and publicly showing that Jesus was the Messiah. So there you have an example of this chapter 3, verse 1. So back to our chapter. So do we need epistles from you or to you? No. Verse 2, you are our epistle. You are the authorization. You are the proof in the pudding. How? How are they their own story? Their lives have changed. From Paul preaching to them who Christ is, they believed the preaching of, the, of Paul, they received the Lord as their Savior, and they went from being dead in trespasses and sins to alive in Christ, and God gave them a new heart. It's obvious what's happened here at Corinth. There's a church that's been formed, and people walking with God. You're our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. It's obvious to anyone who would pay attention, just as people read you. Remember last week, to some we're a savor of life unto life to those who are coming to Christ, but we're a savor of death unto death to those who are perishing, those who are rejecting that ministry of Christ. And so we were asked the question, who is sufficient for these things? Well, we learn in this chapter today, our sufficiencies of Christ. People watch you if you don't know that. Yesterday they watched me move rather fast to get to a wedding, but that's why there are no fish on the back of my car. But you are our epistle written in our hearts. <clears throat> I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> For as much as you are manifestly declared by the epistle of Christ. Okay, so you're our epistle. You're our credentials. People can see you've changed. Verse 3, for as much as you are obviously declared to be the letter of the epistle, the work of Jesus, which was ministered by us as we shared with you. And it was written not with ink, not like some letter, but it was, what writ was written with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of heart. What is he talking about? Okay, yes, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. But he is hinting to us about something that was going to change. Now, if you've read Ezekiel, if you've read Jeremiah, if you've read Malachi, you know what he's talking about. If you don't normally go there, you might miss the reference here. So let's start with Ezekiel chapter 11. Left turn, Ezekiel 11. This, if you've been into those books, would catch your attention. Wait a second. I've heard that before. So go to Ezekiel chapter 11, right near Daniel. Ezekiel 11. Verse 19 of Ezekiel 11, God says through Ezekiel, I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and I will give them a heart of flesh. What will that do for them? That they may walk in my statutes, keep my ordinances and do them. They shall be my people. I will be their God. Turn right in Ezekiel to chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36, mentioned again by God through Ezekiel. Here in verse 24, the Lord goes on and says, I will take you from among the heathen. I will gather you out from all countries. I will bring you into your own land. It's happened. 1948, 1967, even to today. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. That's coming, a revival. Then shall you be clean from all your filthiness, from all your idols. I will cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. <clears throat> I will cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgments. You shall do them. Notice... In verse 30, I will multiply the fruit of the tree, the increase of the field. You'll receive no more the reproach of famine among the heathen. These things are happening. They're back in the land. It's producing. And there's coming a revival where the hearts are changed. How? We'll get to it. Turn now to Jeremiah 31, 31. I know it's hard to memorize. Jeremiah 31, 31. That's not, that's the point. Jeremiah 31, 31. By the way, once you go through these with us in today's chapter, if you'll make the time this week to go home and read Hebrews chapter 8, you will now understand it clearly because of the things we're looking at. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, 
Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. That would be then the law, which is the old covenant, which my commandment they break. Although I was a husbandman unto them, or a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this will be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, on your way out of the Old Testament, stop just before Matthew at Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. Now, as we mentioned, Apollos only knew the baptism of John. And John, when he was put in the prison, <clears throat> hearing what Jesus was doing, eating with the tax collectors, eating with the prostitutes, was troubled. And so he took some of his disciples and said, go and ask him this question from John. Are you the one who is to come or do we look for another? And so they came and they asked Jesus the question. And Jesus said, go and tell John the things that you have seen and heard. The blind can see, the lame can walk, and oh, how happy is the man who has no doubts in me. In other words, I'm doing the miracles Messiah should do. They returned to John. After they left, Jesus began to ask the people, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind, a man in fine clothing. Those are in king's houses. What did you go to see? A prophet? Yes. And I say to you more than a prophet. And Jesus then quotes this, Malachi 3.1. I say unto you that this is the messenger sent before my face. He ascribed John as the prophet to Malachi 3.1. John is a fulfillment of Malachi 3.1. So now let's look at it. Behold, I will send my messenger. Jesus told us in Matthew 11.10, that is John the Baptist. He shall prepare the way before me. This is God himself. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. So God himself is coming. He will suddenly appear at his temple. And look at this. And he will be the messenger of the covenant. What covenant? The new covenant. Moses was a messenger of the first covenant, the old covenant. And Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up unto you a prophet like unto myself, and you better listen to him. He is now the bearer of the new covenant. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in, that's the Messiah. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. What happened on the night he was betrayed? He took the bread, he took the cup, he said, this cup is the new covenant. In what? My blood. He is the bearer of the new covenant. The new covenant where if you believe upon God through his son, he will take out your heart of stone, he will give you a heart of flesh, and he will write on your heart the things we need to know to please him. That's the new covenant. Okay, so back to our chapter. Now see if this makes sense. You are obviously or manifestly declared, verse 3, to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart, the new covenant. By the way, when you receive Jesus into your heart by faith as your Savior, having asked his forgiveness for your sins, you should change. Your life should change. Some change faster than others. Some need more change than others. But you should change. Like he said to the Corinthians, and people should say, you know, I've been watching you. Something's different. You're not cursing all the time with the rest of us. What's wrong? Did you become religious? <laughs> it's happened, hasn't it? They read your life and they see you've changed. Verse 4. And such trust or confidence have we through Christ, through faith in him, to Godward, towards God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. It's all gift. It's all from God. He's filled our hearts. Our sufficiency is of God. So again, we're a savior of life unto those who are coming to life. We're a savior of death unto those who are perishing, who is sufficient for these things. We've been made sufficient through the power of the Holy Spirit, through God in our life. He is our sufficiency. Who has also made us able ministers of the New Testament, that is the new covenant, not of the letter, the law, but of the spirit given by faith. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. What do you mean the letter killeth? 
Well, we learned this in Romans, right? It told us in Romans 3, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified, and by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law reveals your sin. Yesterday, my sin was pointed out quite a few times. <laughs> what was it? Thank you. Had a few green lights, a few orange ones. You know, it happens. <laughs> Pastor, yeah, I'm a sinner too. Don't always drive that way. You show up. I, look, I was late for one wedding by three hours. Yeah, but I know. I, the, did you hear us, the women? Did you hear the gasp of the women? <laughs> did, you, did you catch that, brothers? I left an hour early to get there. And on, sadly, a, a severe accident happened on the turnpike, locked the whole thing down. And so we, but, but in God's defense, not that he needs me to defend them. It was raining when we should have had the ceremony. And when we got there, it stopped raining. We had the ceremony. Right at the end of the ceremony, it started raining again. We would not have been able to hold it, held it had we been on time. So God worked it out, and, and he's now one of our deacons, and his wife still talks to me, and it's all good. So, but I did not want another flashback to that one. So I, I back to our text. He's also made us able ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills. By the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. By the law is the knowledge of sin. It points it out to us. Further down, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. The law points out our sin and lets us know the wages is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, you might say, well, then, well Jim, this is great. Why did he give us the law? <clears throat> Galatians tells us, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. The law was our escort, our school, our taskmaster to bring us to Jesus, to show us we can't save ourselves. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Why? That we might be justified by faith. The law shows you you're breaking the rules. Now, God used it not only to reveal sin. That was one purpose. God also used the law to preserve Israel as a, a unique and peculiar people. Their dietary laws, their restriction on agriculture, even some of their garments, things that God gave them, made them different than the pagans, made it impossible for them to intermix with the pagans. Why? Because God had to get from the line of Abraham, from the tribe of from Jacob, from the tribe of Judah, from the line of David, from the throne there through Nathan, down to a virgin named Mary in Nazareth, espoused to a man named Joseph. From that virgin, he brought forth his own son. God had to preserve a people to bring forth in the fullness of time God in human flesh to fulfill his prophecies. So the law served the purpose of revealing sin, preserving Israel, peculiar people, and also to point to our need for Christ. It did serve a purpose, the first covenant, but now Christ has come. Verse 7, but if the ministration or the ministry of death, <clears throat> that would be the law, written and engraved with stones, if you remember the Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God, carried down by Moses, if that was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Let me explain. Exodus 19, God gathers Israel. A loud trumpet blasts out calling them all from the camp to, to convene. They get there. The mountain is on fire on the top, burning with smoke and fire. The earth is rumbling. God begins to speak, Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. You will have no other gods before me. Goes through the Ten Commandments, some additional information, Exodus 20 there. And the people finally say, Moses, it's too much. We can't take it. You go talk to him and we'll do whatever he says. And so Moses would go up into the mountain with the Lord. By the way, if you were with us in Exodus 19 and 20, we showed you the footage in Saudi Arabia, which is Midian, where Moses fled. There is a mountain. It is burnt on the top. It is black with fire. There is a cave as we would need to have. There are petroglyphs. There is Hebrew. There's a spot where we think is pretty clearly where the golden calf was located. These things have been documented not only by Leonard Moeller in the Exodus case. ArcDiscovery.com has them. Ron Wyatt found them. And the route to get there, you leave Pihahiroth in what we call Sinai, go across the Red Sea. There they found the chariot wheels. They photographed them. The chariots sideways with barnacles on them. They photographed them. There we have found the course of the exodus and the evidence of the children of Israel going through. There's a fence around that facility in Saudi Arabia. It is guarded by the government. You are not supposed to be there, but there have been at least five that have documented it. 
You might say, well, why are they hiding it? Because everywhere Israel goes belongs to them. And it means this book's the right book. So if you're interested in that, go back and listen to Exodus 19 and 20 that we went through, or go get Leonard Moeller's The Exodus Case. Lots of good information with great photos. They found it. But anyway, back to this. It was glorious. <clears throat> it was overwhelming. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses. Why? Because in the presence of God's glory, when Moses came down, his face was basically after glowing from being in the presence of God. So first the people couldn't handle the voice. Now Moses comes down and this glow is coming from him. <clears throat> people are like, Moses, really? Come on. And no, he wasn't up on the mountain with like a little foil thing doing this. <laughs> Just, no, don't give me that. It was the glory of God, but his countenance was, was glowing. There was a radiance coming from it. Which, by the way, if you've ever seen Moses and they appear to have like three horns or two horns on his head, if you've ever seen like a, a disc around him, that's trying to show rays of light, not implying demonic. So if you're an art major and you've seen, that was what it's implying, the radiance still from Moses having come from the presence of God. But that's a little art aside there if you're in the, that stuff. So it was glorious. But the countenance, that glow would fade as he was away from the Lord. So verse 8, how shall not the ministry, the ministry of the Spirit be rather glorious? It eclipses these things. For if the ministration or ministry of condemnation through the law, which reveals sin, and the wages of sin is death, there's no one righteous, we got trouble. If the ministry of condemnation be glory, how much more does the ministration or ministry of righteousness, which comes by faith, which is the new covenant, born by God himself, when he suddenly came to his temple? in his own blood. How much more shall the ministry of righteousness exceed in glory? For even that which was made glorious, the giving of the law there in Mount Sinai, had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excels the new covenant, Emmanuel, God with us, paying for our sin. A simple example or illustration. If you've only seen moonlight, you will be blown away when you finally see the sun. The law was a reflection of what was to come, our need for the Messiah. For if that which is done away was glorious, this passing law, now Hebrews 8 will make sense to you if you read it. If that which was done away, the law, first covenant, was glorious. Hebrews 8 says, why would God mention a new covenant when they already had the old one? Because the old one was temporary. And the new covenant is eternal. But you can read that in Hebrews 8 for yourself. If that which is done away was glorious, the old covenant, which should bring us to Jesus, much more that which remains, the new covenant, is glorious. Romans 10, 4 says it this way. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. He paid it all. Well, seeing that we have such hope, we've been redeemed through Jesus, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. In other words, they were, they were overwhelmed to see it, but it was also fading. So Moses covered it so they wouldn't, well, now what? He covered his face. He put a veil over for several reasons. Not like that. You see, verse 14, their minds, whose minds? The children of Israel were blinded. For unto this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. They hear the Old Testament if they go to synagogue, but they don't get it. What do you mean? Which veil is done away in Christ? Okay. Okay. Do you remember last week? What is a 211 in progress? <clears throat> Robbery. Robbery, good. And what was our text, right? We're not ignorant of the enemy's devices, lest he should take advantage of us. Chapter 211, getting robbed. Let me explain one of the enemy's devices to you from history. Jesus told us the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed placed into the ground, which will grow and have many branches, and the birds of the air lodge in the branches. Yes, remember that parable? How many don't? Okay, well, please look at Matthew 13. You'll find it. In the same context of those parables, he told us, a man went forth sowing seed. Some seed fell on the path, and the 
birds snatched it away. Jesus then expounded or explained that parable, and he said, those who are the path are those who hear the word of God, and the devil comes and snatches away what they've heard. Birds represent satanic activity in that parable. Shortly after will come the mustard seed. Okay, the kingdom of heaven will be like a seed planted in the ground, which will grow into many branches, and birds will infiltrate some of the branches. Interpret it. Satan will infiltrate parts of the church in its history. Would you say that's a reasonable interpretation? Yes, it is. Let me explain. Because there have been things like the Crusades, like the Spanish Inquisition, and different programs against the Jews that have been at times instigated by so-called Christians who called the Jews Christ killers, who went after them because of what happened in the rejection of Jesus, who put them to death, forcing them either to convert to Christianity or die because of these abuses through history. When you encounter, for example, Jews in Israel or even some here in the United States and say, I want to tell you about Jesus Christ, the shields go immediately up. Out comes the baggage from the church's history where the enemy has infiltrated. And what has happened is the very one who can open their eyes to their scripture, Satan has made sure through corrupting the church at different times in history, they will not even listen to his name. It is the ultimate catch 22. It is the name that will set them free and open their scriptures, but it's the very name the devil made sure they don't want to hear. How many now get this? Like, aha, that's what's played out. So much so, when we go to Israel, we take candy, we take different things, and we stop as much as we can at military installations. Two years ago, we stopped at an Iron Dome battery. That 1,400 missiles coming in, we thank God for them. We didn't have any problems. They took care of the job. We stopped last year at an infantry division. Some of these guys were in Gaza just months before clearing tunnels. And these are 18-year-old kids to 22, 23-year-olds. They're kids. No offense if you're 18, 20. They're kids. You look at them and you're like, I got sons at home and daughters. And we come and we always have the ladies. Listen, ladies, they're going to be really resistant. Get the moms. So just go at it. And they come in. You come here. And they're like, because they're boys. Don't you know, come in. And they start shoveling candy in their pockets and everything. And, and you can see they're kind of like, what is this? What's going on? And the commander of the post is always like, okay, what is me? But then he realized that well, these people are actually genuine. They're glad to be here. They love us. They're taking photos. This is great. You know, and, or no photos, depending on where we were. And, uh, and our guide always explains, these are evangelical Christians. They love Israel. They love the land. They love the God of the word, and they love Jews. And they're praying for you guys. And they say, you're serious. These guys are Christians, and they care about us. Why would they say that? Because today in the church, there's replacement theology. Israel is no longer God's apple of his eye. There's preterist view of Revelation. It's all historical, so Israel has no special place in the future, which is completely wrong. I mean, ask a kid to read Revelation. They'll know it's future. But that's what's happening. And because of these opinions, well, we should boycott Israel, we should do whatever. And so the Jews today are hearing of so-called modern, what they think are evangelical Christians who say, God's done with Israel, we boycott them, we don't agree with their positions, they're the oppressor, etc., etc. That's what we're up against even today. I told you two years ago, when we came back from the time we were there and Gaza was exploding and it was all going on, we left the Iron Dome facility and this one woman, this young girl, ran out from under the barricade. I'm leaving, my guide and I are walking back towards the bus. I feel a hand grab my wrist. She turns me around and she said, you really care about us? Everybody hates us. I said, not us. Your God is working. You're back in the land. He's going to open the eyes of Israel. A revival is coming. Your God is just getting started again for you guys. That's what you're up against. Well, thanks a lot, Pastor. So now when I try to talk to someone who's Jewish, be the Israeli or United States, and I try to start telling them about Jesus, I'm stuck. No, you're not. Take them to their own scriptures. Ask them several questions. Question. We're told the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head, the devil's power. Yeah. We're told that he'll be born of a virgin born in Bethlehem. Yeah, we're told that when Messiah comes, we'll know him because he'll open the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, the lame will walk. Yeah, we're told that when he is rejected, they're going to spit upon his face, rip out his beard. He's going to be betrayed. 
Yeah, we're told that they're going to beat him with a scourge. Psalm 22, they're going to pierce his hands and his feet. They're going to kill him between thieves or criminals, yet they're going to bury him with the rich, yet somehow he's going to rise again and divide with his followers the results of his victory. These are the things that your Bible, your Old Testament says must happen. That Messiah will ride in on a donkey, meek, lowly, having salvation. He'll ride in on the day appointed, Daniel 9. Here it is, after Nehemiah gets his decree. After he rides in, they're going to execute him, cut him off like a criminal, and shortly after that, the temple in the city will be destroyed. Who in human history before 70 AD opened the eyes of the blind, ears of the deaf, rode in on a donkey, betrayed, killed, between thieves, buried with rich, rose again, and the city wiped out? There's only one person in history. And I've seen about a handful of Jews finally go, it's got to be Jesus of Nazareth. And guess what? Off comes the veil. Use their scriptures to show them what Messiah should do. And then ask them to explain to you from history who, before 70 AD, has done this. You won't be surprised. God will bring them to their scriptures. God will touch their hearts. So the Jews that we have in our lives, different folks, we've got some in the medical community and all that. When I see them, I always say, man, there's some cool stuff going on right now from your Bible. And they're like, what? What, what are you talking about? And I'm like, this and that, Old Testament. I'm like, you should check it out. <laughs> see you next time. 11 kids, we'll be back. Someone's always sick. <laughs> see you next time. That's how you do it. You, you basically say, man, this is so good. Uh, you got to get your own. This is so good. It's over there. It's what it's saying. Their minds were blinded for until this day. There remains the same veil, verse 14, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. They hear it in their synagogue, but they don't get it. <clears throat> and the catch 22 is the veil is done away in Christ and Jesus. But even under this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it, it who, when Israel, when a Jew shall turn to the Lord, and that's not easy, the veil shall be taken away. Now, there's also a work of God involved in this, and that's Romans 11. Turn to Romans 11 for a second. Left turn, Romans 11. Verse 25 I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, not something we cannot know, but something now being more fully revealed. I would not, brethren, you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits, with, you know, replacement theology and preterist theology. That blindness, in part, has happened to Israel, next word, until. What does that mean? Until something's done. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Then all Israel shall be saved as it is written. So let me explain. The early church was 100% Jewish. Then quality control went down and went to the half Jew, known as the Samaritans. Then quality control went out the window and it went to the Gentiles, Acts 10 and 11, right? But the church was born on a day, started Jewish, half Jewish, and there still are Jews today, primarily Gentiles. But the church is also going to be removed on a day. And then is going to come the final seven-year period of history, the time of Jacob's trouble, where God is going to refine Israel. And they will, they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As Malachi 3.2 happens, the day of the Lord starts. That's what's coming. So what are you trying to say? Who knows how long we have, but that net's filling up. And the Lord's going to bring this catch home. And finish his work with Israel. You'll know because you'll see a falling away and you'll see right becoming wrong and you'll see Russia take over things like Crimea, which is part of the invasion of Israel with Libya, which is unstable, and Persia, which is uh, Iran. Uh, so if you see those things, just keep your eyes out. It's a little help there. So the veil is done away in Jesus, in Christ. But even under this day when Moses is read, back to our chapter, verse 15, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when Israel, when it, when the Jews turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And I've seen God do this. Now the Lord is that spirit. By the way, he and the Father are one. Three distinct persons, one in essence. Behold, um, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The word is ekhad. A man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife. They become 
one flesh, Echad. The Lord our God is Echad, one Lord, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're one, same essence, three persons. Now the Lord is that Spirit. They're one, yet three distinct persons. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We're free. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass or a mirror. Guess what Corinth manufactured? Brass, which they polished into mirrors. They'd all, oh yeah, yeah, we got lots of those. We all with open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We are metamorpho in the Greek. We are being changed into the same image. We are becoming more like him. As we look to him, we change. Known and read of all men, we change. We become more like him. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, because he's writing on your heart that has been turned from stone to flesh, because you've actually believed the Messiah has come, bearing the new covenant, which is in his blood, so you can be redeemed. Isn't that cool? Let's stand, let's pray. Lord God, we come before you as a nation. And how we pray for uh, some legal issues right now in Kentucky, Lord, we pray the First Amendment would stand. And it's amazing how the press can't seem to see that they're yoked with us in that First Amendment. But we pray that, Father, the things that the Founding Fathers fought and died for shall not be infringed. We ask you would lead our country, Lord, raise up godly men and women to direct it when it is in such a time of confusion. Thank you for being good to us, Lord, and faithful. And Lord, as we read in chapter 5 in a few weeks, we're your ambassadors. And thank you, Lord, we know history. Before war is declared, the ambassadors are removed. And we wonder how long. Thank you, Lord. Strengthen us in our walk, we pray this week in Jesus' name. Amen.